And these are the words of Martin Luther. I shall ask God mercifully to protect us. Then I shall fumigate, help purify the air, administer medicine and take it. I shall avoid places and persons where my presence is not needed in order not to become contaminated and thus perchance inflict and pollute others and so cause their death as a result of my negligence. If God should wish to take me, he will surely find me. And I have done what he has expected of me, and so, and so I am not responsible for either my own death or the death of others. If my neighbor needs me, however, I shall not avoid place or person, but will go freely as stated above. See, this is such a God-fearing faith because it is neither brash nor foolhardy and does not tempt God. So anyway, there's, pretty, there's uh, an interesting perspective from a man that uh, many in the Christian world respect and has been certainly a, a positive voice for God's people uh, because of his writings there in the 1600s. So anyway, let's get into the uh, message today. The title of my message is The Judge of All the Earth. The Judge of All the Earth. Heavenly Father, I thank you today for your mercy. I'm asking God that you would touch our lives. I thank you that you are God. You have been God and you will ever be God. And we really appreciate that. I'm asking today by the power of your Holy Ghost that you would quicken each one of our spirits. That you would strengthen us. Lord, strengthen your people not only for this hour, but for the days ahead of them. Lord, the one place you talked about feeding Elijah, and he went in the strength of that meat for the next 40 days. Lord, I believe that you want to feed your people. And I believe that your people are going to have uh, test trials and wilderness experiences ahead of them. They may have not seen before. But, Lord, you will always provide enough to get through those seasons. And so, God, thank you for pouring out your grace upon your people in this day and in this hour in which we live. And we bless you now, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Once again, those of you that need prayer, uh, if you can text me directly on my phone, uh, and we will pray for those needs at the end of the service. And uh, God's been doing some awesome thing and answering some great prayers. We had a uh, wonderful prayer night on Wednesday night for those of you that were able to come out, and we'll continue to do so. We'll have a minimum of 10 people on Wednesday nights. But uh, there was just an awesome presence of God came into this place on Wednesday night. It's, it was one of those times that you treasure, you just... You just don't want to get out of it. It's just so precious and so awesome, and it does something to your spirit. It liberates your soul, and it gives you freedom like nothing else in this world will do. There's something awesome about the presence of God. And uh, so it was just really neat. Uh, the, the Bible verses that were coming out, the... Uh, the words that people were getting. One of the things that I really feel strongly in my spirit, and I felt it on Wednesday night, was that God is purging his people. God is purging his people. I want to read you an excerpt from World Magazine, uh, written by one of the writers in there. <clears throat> one of my greatest concerns is, in this time that we're going through, is the state of the church. Um, I see people getting on fire for God. This thing is actually awakening people. And then I feel in other ways for people that are lukewarm or maybe even backslidden, I see this having a different effect, a negative effect upon them. And so this is what the writer of this uh, uh, article said is referring, referring to the COVID-19 shutdown. It says, Our churches will need to be rebuilt. 
Never, notice the word never, never in our nation's history has the church at large been compelled to put on a disappearing act first for several, first for several weeks and now stretching into months. What makes us think that we'll come through that aberration unscathed? It's not primarily that millions of dollars worth of pews and buildings lie empty every week. More disturbing are reports from significant and once healthy churches that only a fraction of members are now taking advantage of live, street, of live streaming worship and tithes and offerings are slipping. Will our churches rediscover their true biblical mission of making and training disciples? Only a fraction of once healthy church, churches, only a fraction of their members are even taking advantage of live stream worship. And so anyway, folks, um, this is a time to dig into God, not fall away from God. And I believe if churches would have stayed open in this time, I believe you would have seen an increase of attendance. But since they're closed, people are turning to other mediums and uh, things to fill their minds and their hearts. And uh, because of that, I believe it's going to have a purging effect on God's people. And that actually may be a positive in the long run. So, title of my message this morning is The Judge of All the Earth. We're engaged in an intense battle in this time that we're living in. If there ever was a time that we need apostles and prophets and intercessors, it is now. If there's anyone that knows how to pray, it's time to seek God now. It's time that we seek God with our families it's time that we spend time studying and seeking out the scriptures and, and trying to get God's perspective on how he looks upon humanity and planet Earth. Folks, it's amazing. You read through the Old Testament, the illustrations that are in the Old Testament, the similarities between uh, what happened in, in Israel thousands of years ago the similarities between then and now is striking. It's very telling. And we, through looking at those similarities, we figure out that it's still the same God and still the same devil and still the same humanity. Making good decisions and bad decisions. So we need intercessors in our age. And that's why we're going to continue to pray as God's people on behalf of our generation. Because there are many that are going to be swept away because they didn't have enough of oil in their lamps to be able to weather the tests and the trials that are ahead of them. There's a flood of information that is being released across the earth. Much of the information is filled with lies and false propaganda. Never before has a generation had to sort through such an excess of lies to find truth. The lie has become the normal in our world and in our society, in our courtrooms, and sadly, it all started behind our pulpits. Pastors preach messages for a bribe, for a pat on the back, for a good name. Folks, if there was ever a time I was glad to be the pastor of a little country church, it's now. God has brought us all down to the same plane and the same field. What matters now is not light, smoke, and entertainment. 
What matters now is whether, enough, whether or not we have enough of oil in our lamps. What matters now is whether or not this plague has found us sleeping or awake. What matters now is whether or not our loins have been girded about with truth and whether or not our lights are burning. I would to God that His Word would once again be a lamp to His people's feet and a light under their path. I would to God that the church would once again have a biblical worldview. Notice I didn't say Christian worldview, I said a biblical worldview. Truth is going to be our costliest investment, and it's going to be the most rare coin to find in the days that lie before us. Proverbs says, buy the truth and sell it not. Isaiah 59, 15 says this, Yea, truth faileth, and he that departs from evil makes himself a prey. And the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment. Did Isaiah say that in 2020? Huh. That verse is real in our world. This is the multitude of chariots and horses that we just sang about. Some trust in chariots or in man or in horses. This is the multitude. This is the army that we as God's people are up against. We're, uh, we are outnumbered, we are outfinanced, we don't have the connections with the people you're supposed to have connections with according to this world system. However, there's a connection that we have, and in the end it's going to make all the difference. In verse 16... Of Isaiah 59, it goes on to read, it says, And he saw that there was no man, and he wondered that there was no intercessor. He wondered that there was no intercessors. Is someone at Truth Light Life Mission going to stand up and say, I'm going to be that intercessor? I'm going to be that man, I'm going to be that woman, that boy, that girl that is concerned, that sighs and cries because truth is falling in the streets. Because too many people don't care anymore. Because the gospel has been watered down. The gospel has been decaffeinated. It ain't got no stuff in it anymore. We're the men and women that are going to seek God and hunger after God. And wait on God until God shows up on their behalf. We're God's connection to this earth. Every single one of us, no matter how old, young you are, you have a work to fulfill in this unprecedented time that we're living in. Although many of us, uh, for me, my life hasn't changed a whole lot. I still have money in the bank, bank clothes on my back, food in, in, in the uh, kitchen. God has been good and He's been merciful. And I really appreciate it. But I don't like the storm that's brewing on the horizon. It's real. I 
I don't apologize for bringing politics into the pulpit today. But our governor here in Virginia passed a set of sweeping laws while our nation was under siege in this coronavirus and on Easter weekend. Passed laws that if this coronavirus would have, wouldn't have taken over this land would have never happened because there would have been too many people protesting in front of the nation's capital in Richmond. But these snakes and these liars will lie, cheat, and steal from the lives of good people and try to suppress them. I don't like that. As a pastor, I don't like that. We'll, we'll abort babies. We'll pass laws to allow men and women to go into any restroom that they want to, regardless of their sex. These are the kinds of laws that just got passed last weekend. It's time someone starts praying. It's time we start looking to the judge of the earth. If the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, do you think God is just going to let this stuff go on in America? Without standing up and judging its actions? He's not going to. He's not going to let it go on. He is still the judge of all the earth. But here's the difficult thing, folks. In the middle of God judging the wicked, as much as our lives are intertwined through everyday life and business and our economy and everything else, our lives are going to be affected by it. The devil is not a sheep led to the slaughter like Jesus was. He'll go kicking and screaming and lying and cheating all the way to his grave, accusing. This is what we're up against. Public shaming has become the weapon of the day for the news media, regardless of an individual's constitutional rights. We will shame you. We'll put your name out there and, and people will look down on you and scoff at you. Hmm. Didn't they do that in the Bible? It ain't nothing new. They'll put pressure on you. They will betray you. Good people will, be, will betray you. Uh, so I'm going through Samuel right now. The book of Samuel. David, so he's running from Saul. And he hears that the Philistines are going down and invading uh, one of the, the cities of Israel. And so David and his men hear what's going on. Uh, I think the, the name of the town was uh, Keilah, however you pronounce it. Kila, Keilah, something like that. And so David and his men go down. They save the town, push back the Phil Philistines. The Philistines left. And so they enjoyed the victory, and then David starts goes to God. He says, God, am I safe in this town? Are these people going to protect me if Saul finds out that I'm down here? You know what God said? God said, these people are going to betray you and give you up to Saul if you don't get out of here. David ran for his life. Now, mind you, he had just gotten done saving the city. 
and the same people that he saved were going to betray him. This is the road that God's people are going to have to navigate in the days ahead. Are you up for the challenge? There's some people in here are. There's some people watching on YouTube. You are. God's raising up a generation that's got some resolve, courage. I don't know what God's going to lead us into in the days ahead. In the middle of God's word being established on this earth, we are seeing and are going to see an ever-increasing flood of resistance against men and women who hold the truth and righteousness. These things are going to happen. If you're going to stand for God, you're going to stand up for truth in the days ahead. People are going to betray you. They are going to shame you. It's been a tactic of hell for six, seven thousand years ever since he went and deceived Eve in the Garden of Eden. Folks, we're at war. If you don't feel or see the war yet, hang on. It's coming to your house. But there's a few of us who've been praying and seeking God. We see it. And our eyes are open and we're watching. And we're seeing the enemy come as quick as his head pops up over that hill. We got our sights on him and we see him. There are men and women in this congregation that are going to have the energy and resolve to stand up against this storm. If you're looking for easy in the days ahead, keep looking because you ain't going to find it in God's kingdom. If you're looking for awesome, then hang on for the ride. I want awesome. I want God. It hasn't been easy in the 20 years I've been serving it. Hasn't been easy. It's never going to be easy. There's a storm ahead of us, folks. But right in the middle of the storm, God's going to show himself strong. How are we ever going to witness Jesus walking on the water if we don't go into the storm? How are we ever going to witness him showing up in the furnace if we ever don't ever get thrown in the furnace? There could very well be men and women that are part of this congregation that will one day spend, their, spend time in prison because of the faith that they, uh, the faith that they have and the church that they go to. This could, this could be you and I now. Well, preacher, you're scaring me. I'm preparing you. God's preparing us. That way when it happens, you know that God has warned us in advance. Somebody's got to pray. Who among us is going to care for the burdens of this generation? <clears throat> Where is the intercessor that's going to sigh and cry because of the, 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 the sin that's upon the land? I don't know what was in Simeon and Anna, those two old people. They just kept going into the temple. 
You can't tell me that they went in there every day and felt God and all goosebumps and all awesome. They went in there every day because it was their duty. They had a responsibility toward God because of the call that was on their life, and they fulfilled it, and heaven blessed it. We're going to have to serve God in the days ahead because of our, it's our duty and our responsibility whether or not the feelings are involved. That's how we raise up men and women of courage and determination. The man that found in this church was one of the most determined individuals I have ever seen in my life. And if there's an inheritance that I wanted from that man, it was that determination and courage. And I want it for this church. And I believe we got it. I saw hell try to hinder him so many times. Just like he's going to you and I. The devil can hinder the work of God. Don't let any false prophet tell you he can't. Because I'm going to name it and claim it. Oh, praise the Lord. Everything's coming. It's all going to be awesome and great. And until you get knocked flat on your face. Because he doesn't like us. The devil can hinder the work of God, but he will never stop it. Did he hinder Moses? He fought the children of Israel all the way through the wilderness. Every step of the way, there was a constant pressure from a million people up against a man of God. He hindered it. But he didn't stop it. God's going, uh, Satan's going to try to hinder the work and has been trying to hinder the work that he wants to do in this place. He may have hindered it, but he's not going to stop it. One thing about the difference between the devil and, and God is the devil has a hard time concentrating. And God is honed in. Focused. He's patient. And he doesn't force anybody to make a decision for him. He tries to greatly influence us through the prayers of, of people that love us. But he will never force us to live for him. Satan's not like that. He will shame you. He will ridicule you. He will mock you to try to get you to conform to his way of doing things. And he's got a pretty high success rate, but he is cruising for bruising because he's going to take him and his army right off the edge of a cliff in the days ahead. Because God is... Still the judge of all the earth. Is there anyone spiritual enough to look at the world around from an eternal perspective? I want God to do what he, what he needs to do in my life in the next five years. What if that ain't God's original plan? What if God is setting you up? What if, what if you're an instrument in God's work and plan for the generations to come? Are you and I going to be okay with that? If our sons, our daughters, our grandsons and granddaughters actually benefit from the blessing of God to a greater extent than we did, Isn't that what happened to Abraham? He was an instrument in God's plan for generations to come. And somehow we in this fast food generation, we got to have everything in five years or we're upset. 
God, if you don't use me in the next five years, I'm going to quit. He ain't going to use you in the next five years. We've got to stay the course regardless of what happens. We're in this thing for eternity, folks. Our 70, 80 years on this earth, they're just a blip on the screen. We've got to make sure we stand strong in that time. We've got to make sure that we, 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 we live for God and, and influence people uh, righteously around us. Who is going to be able to withstand the pressure when it increases and multiplies in your life because of what you believe? Pressure. Human beings, courageous human beings, are amazing under pressure. Do they ever fly off the handle? Oh, yeah, every now and then. But they stay the course. They don't flip on people. There's too many good believers that I've known over the years have flipped on me. Stood for one thing for many years, and all of a sudden they wilted. When the hot sun came out, the pressure turned on. They went back to Egypt. It's not good. It's a testimony of unstable character. We got to be stable people. Believers right now are being drugged. Drugged by the cares of this life. And the deceitfulness of riches is putting them to sleep. If someone doesn't pray and seek God, they're going to be snared and gone forever. If there ever was a time we need to pray for our families, it's now. We need to pray for our grandbabies. Now. Now. Spiritual death is a plague that is even more contagious than the coronavirus. There is nothing more devastating in a believer's life than to have spirituality and life pulled out of their spirit. Because of the cares of this world and everything around them. Folks, we're going to have to live for God. If there wasn't a Cyrus in our world right now, many of the freedoms that we lost over this time of quarantine from this plague... Many of those freedoms would be relinquished forever. There wouldn't be a Cyrus in our world. I'm convinced more than ever that our president is a Cyrus according to Isaiah 45. Did you know without Cyrus coming to Israel's rescue with the authority to grant them the permits and all the paperwork, as well as the finances, they would have never built that second temple. Well, Cyrus wasn't an Israelite. Why did God use him? Because he's the judge of all the earth. He can do whatever he wants to do. And that's what he's doing in our world right now. When our president got elected that night, November 
2016, I witnessed something that I never thought I would ever see in my life. A man come through the most horrible attacks, the lies, the betrayal, the accusations that he went through for 18 months to become president was nothing short of amazing. And three and a half years later, that has not stopped. How can we think as Christians that it's going to be anything less in the days ahead? But along with that pressure, along with the challenges, has come victories and, 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 and triumphs like never before. How can God be amazing and awesome if life is good all the time? Everything that happened is great and awesome. Human beings were created for adversity. We weren't created to grow up in a greenhouse culture. Where we don't never run into any problems or trials and tests. God help me if I stub my toe, I'm going to have a bad week. It's time to build. And it's going to be a work that's going to be set aside for determined individuals. You've got some backbone. How do you respond when people betray you? How do you and I respond when people lie about us? How do, pe how do you and I respond when we're misunderstood? Well, I've got to defend myself and prove that I'm right everywhere I go. No, you don't. God is the judge of all the earth. And if we're living for Him, He's got your back. But I don't feel like it right now, preacher. It didn't look like it. Darwin talked about the... the the crucifixion and the resurrection. For three days, hell was partying. And then the curtain rose. They didn't know the stage was being set the whole time. The stage is being set upon planet Earth for God's kingdom to return. And you and I get to be a part of it. Isn't that awesome? That gives me hope that my redemption is coming. That I've got something to live for. That we've got something to die for. That I can raise my family up in the hope of God's salvation in the midst of a world that is reeling to and fro like a drunkard, the Bible says. I can have hope that even though truth is falling in the streets, that I'll be able to teach my babies the ways of God. In the midst of this flood of information and lies and propaganda from hell. God's people like never before are going to need favor with the leaders of our land. It's important that we pray for our, our president, for our local leaders, for our governor. It's important. It's important that we vote. If you're not registered, get yourself registered and vote. At least if I vote and it doesn't go my way, i got reason to gripe about it.
啊。Let's go to Isaiah chapter forty-five. This is good news. Now, in the midst of this, the lies and the cheating and the stealing, the backbiting and the betrayal. <coughs> Listen to this. I already talked about the Cyrus part in the first few verses. But let's go to verse six. It says that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is none else. There ain't no other. God's still in control. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Now, if you ever want to cause controversy in a little Bible study or something, drop that verse and let people chew on it. But we ain't going to go there this morning. I'm going to verse 8. Now, this is a picture of God's grace and His salvation Rescuing humanity on planet Earth. Listen to this. Drop down, you heavens, from above. And let the skies pour down righteousness. I want to be living right here. Let the earth open. And let it bring forth salvation. At the end of the day, God's still the creator of the ends of the earth. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. It doesn't matter what these liars, these cheaters, these spirits of hell try to accomplish on planet earth. God's creation has been created to produce life and grace and hope. And God's creation is going to come to rescue his people. He's a creator God. Even the heavens are His, the earth. Let the earth open and let it bring forth salvation. And let righteousness spring up together. I, the Lord, have created it. Isaiah was prophesying of a time where it looked like Israel had no hope, Israel had no future, their name was, was, was getting ready to be uh, lost throughout the world because the people were being dispersed and, and there was no one to care for them. There was no one to stand up for them in the high places. And God raised up Cyrus. He raised up someone to help his people. If enough of people cry out to God, God is going to raise up men and women in our land. God is going to uh, manipulate situations and courts and the laws of our land to help his people. Folks, I'm convinced there's still salt in America. Maybe not much. But I believe somebody's going to get a hold of God. Somebody's going to stay the course. The wicked can just go on, continue to lie, cheat, and steal. But they're living on the wrong planet. You tried the wrong place. You're doing it, 
and you're not the landlord. Our landlord is the God of heaven. And he's got some tenants that have a rightful place here, and that's you and I. The wicked can continue to can try to hinder God's work, but they will never stop it. <coughs> I don't care how many bills are passed in our state legislature and our Congress. Who's the governor? Who's the mayor? Who's the president? They will not stop God's work. And they're not going to stop you in either. Your family may lie about you. Your loved ones may think you're crazy. Your grandchildren may wish that their grandma never prayed. But somebody is going to have some patience and long-suffering to see their prayers come to pass here on planet Earth. The forces of creation are on our side. The Lord Jesus Christ himself is still seated at the right hand of the Father. Regardless of what happens to you and I in the days ahead. They hindered Ezra. They didn't stop him. Did you know after Cyrus issued that decree to go back and build that temple? If I'm not mistaken, and I, and I wanted to verify the timeline, but for the sake of time this morning I couldn't. But if I'm not mistaken, it was at least 15 years before they actually dedicated that temple. All along the way, they ran into people who tried to hinder that work. Men in high places tried to stop it. The Bible says that they hired counselors against them to frustrate them in the building and, and tried to stop it. They hindered it. It should have been built in a mere few years, two, three years. Because they had the money, they had the permit, they had the plans, they had the backing. And then people rose up against them as they will every single time God tries to do something. Every time God goes to do a work in a people, the snakes will always come out of the woodwork. Mark it down. Before God does something great, there's going to always be betrayal, misunderstanding, and lies to try to hinder that work. They didn't stop the build, rebuilding of that temple, though. It was being completed, ended up being complete years later. They discouraged the people. That's why he sent Haggai the prophet said, hey, you people, you're dwelling in your nice houses in this temple here. You all started on it, and uh, it's not finished. <coughs> he sent, he sent uh, men to wake up Israel. And they were able to complete it. The forces of darkness hindered Nehemiah, but they didn't stop him. He got all the information and the grants and the permits he needed to go back and build that wall in Jerusalem. He went back to Jerusalem only to find that Jerusalem was full of a bunch of snakes and thieves in the middle of all the good people. There were heathen people 
that were in the priesthood. That was a no-no in the Jewish and the Israelite nation. If you didn't have the genealogy, you weren't supposed to be a Levite, much less a priest. So all these people would work their way into the the structure, the, the governing structure and body of Jerusalem. And here comes Nehemiah and said, we're going to build a wall. <coughs> You're going to build a wall? Some of the very people that were going to benefit from that wall are the people that rose up against him. Thank God Nehemiah had backbone. There's some people at True Light Life Mission going to have some backbone in the days ahead. You've made up your mind. And a made up mind is a hard thing to change. Moses was hindered. That didn't stop him. God just used the second generation. First generation don't want to. Okay, go ahead. You don't want the promised land? Help yourself. Who use the next generation? Folks, if we, if we don't want this, God's going to use your children. I want it. I want to be that Caleb. I want to be that Joshua. That's here to help this next generation. I don't want to be the group of people that murmurs and complains and dies in the wilderness. Can't have that. The grace of God rescuing His people. Drop down heavens. Let the skies pour down righteousness. Let the earth open and let it bring forth salvation. I, the Lord, have created it. Daniel 7. I don't have time to go into context of this, but it's a few verses, but it kind of talks about that same scenario. It says, 721, it says, The horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them until... The Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Could it be that we're standing at the threshold of this major shift that's happening in the church world and across this universe in general? Could it be that we may see some things in the days ahead that we never dreamed would be possible on planet Earth? I believe we're going to see those things, folks. But I also know from Scripture that it is not going to come without a fight. The God of this world is not going to give up ground to the Christians without fighting tooth and nail. That's his way of doing it. I tell you what, folks, we got grace on our side. We got the Ancient of Days. We have the Lord Jesus Christ and the holy angels to help us. I'm going to turn to Psalm 85 here in closing. Oh, Jesus. Psalm 85. There's a scripture similar to what I read in Isaiah 45. I will hear what God the Lord will speak. I'm in verse 8 of 85 of Psalm. For he will speak peace unto his people and to his saints. But let them not turn again to folly. 
Surely his salvation is nigh them that fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Now, what's that look like? I'd like to know. Glory dwelling in our land? Brother, I want that. Verse 10. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace kissed each other. And truth shall spring out of the earth. These God-haters, they ain't going to be able to get away from truth. It may be falling in the streets, but truth is going to chase them down. Because here it says it's going to come out of the very ground that we tread upon. Isn't that awesome? We're living on God's earth, not the devil's. Truth shall spring out of the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yea, the Lord shall give that which is good, and our land will yield her increase. I want that for myself, for this church, for our families, for our households. Righteousness shall go before him and shall set us in the way of his steps. That's some of the most inspiring words that you ever read that's in the Bible. So when you think you're swallowed up in a world of lies and you don't know which way is up or down, You grab a Bible verse like this and say, God, I may have been lied about, I may have been cheated, I may have been stolen from, but you said the truth is going to spring out of the earth. And you are the judge of all the earth, and you will vindicate me as your son, as your daughter. This is who we are as God's people. We are fighters. And only when God tells us to lay down our sword and die as sheep led to the slaughter, only then we will, and even then it may be difficult. Jesus knew his time had come. That's why when he stood before those courts, he just zipped his lip. He ain't going to convince a bunch of offended people. You're wasting your time trying to prove your right to a person that's rebellious and offended. So this is the world that we're walking into, folks. And it's time we arm ourselves spiritually. It's time we pray. Because that grace of God's going to be activated by prayer in our world, in our lives, in our churches. And the grace of God, what we just read about the, the, the heavens dropping down in righteousness and truth springing out of the earth, That is nothing short of the mere grace of God rescuing his people in difficult times and thoroughly irritating the wicked around us. And when I say wicked, I'm I'm not talking about uh, those people around you that need to get saved. I'm talking about those that are, they've got it set in their minds. They're going to live for the devil. They don't want no parts of God and they will persecute God's people. Those are the people that God's going to have a day against. It's not going to be pretty. So, Heavenly Father, today, once again, and I thank you for your quickening hand of life and life more abundant coming upon your people in the days ahead. God, I'm asking you, quicken every household that's represented here and on this live stream today. Quicken them, God. Touch their lives, touch their families. May the oil and the anointing of the Holy Ghost rest upon the walls of every home. May your creation grace your people as we go out and about our everyday lives. 
Lord, just thinking about walking off planet Earth and truth coming out of the ground every day that we go down, uh, walk this planet. And every day that we live, that the heavens are dropping down in righteousness. And all we got to do is lift up our heads and salvation is drawing nigh. Lord, thank you that we live in our Father's world and not the devil's. We bless you now. We thank you in Jesus' name. If there's anyone who has any prayer requests, just send them over to me now. I think I got at least one or two. Dear Jesus, Darwin, why don't you come up here and pray for this one? Time out about 30 seconds, so just keep your hand on it. Dear Jesus. All right, uh, <clears throat> this is for the niece of Kim. She is past her due date. Well, Father, we lift, we lift Kim's niece up to your throne this morning. Lord, we just pray for that baby to yes. come. Lord, we rebuke any complications. That's right. We pray for the peace of God to be upon her. Lord, you did it for Brittany. She had a desire not to be induced, Lord, and you did it for her, and we just pray you do it again, Lord. It's nothing too hard for you, Lord. You can do everything, and we just pray peace over her, Lord, and life to that baby. You are the Father of life, Lord. You're the creator of life, and we thank you for life in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, God. Okay, is there anyone in this place needs prayer for anything? Any of those that are here part of this? Yes. Heavenly Father, I pray for Seth right now. Or whatever is going on in his body. I'm asking for your hand of blessing to keep him. I'm asking that you would uphold him with the right hand of your salvation. I speak life to his spirit, life to his soul, life to his body in Jesus' name. Lord, thank you for your goodness and your favor being extended upon his life and in his world. And we bless you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, God. Okay, I really appreciate everyone tuning in once again today. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, we got another one. Okay. This is Joanne from Ohio. What, what was that need again? Can you read it again? Okay. Heavenly Father, I pray for Joanne right now. I come against these evil spirits that are trying to torment her soul. Lord, I speak release upon her spirit. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your goodness being extended in her life. Lord, I'm asking for clarity of mind, for clarity of spirit to touch her now by the power of the Holy Ghost. Lord, we have no might against this company. And I'm asking God that you would touch Joanne right now. By your grace, I pray for our family. Lord, salvation to be upon them. Grace to be upon them. Lord, that you would save their eternal souls. And I'm asking God that you continue to give Joanne the wisdom on how to speak to her family, how to pray for her family. And I thank you right now for helping her in Jesus' name. Amen. Dear God in heaven.
Okay, this is from uh, Brad Snyder. He's asking for prayer for Laura and Mary uh, because they went to view one of their sisters who passed away. And so anyway, that they would have peace in their hearts and be safe from any illnesses that, that may have been exposed. Heavenly Father, I pray for Laura and Mary right now. I'm asking that you would protect them. Lord, keep them safe in this time. Lord, I know this uh, coronavirus has been extremely devastating to el elderly people and people with weakened immune systems. And I'm asking right now that you would protect both of them in this time. That you would give them supernatural strength and grace to be able to live every day to the fullest. And we bless you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, God in heaven. All righty. Well, thank you all for tuning in. Once again, we will have prayer meeting on Wednesday night. Uh, I will have a limit of 10 people, so let me know if you want to be a part of that. If I end up having too many people, I'll probably just kind of sort it out according to those that uh, haven't been here yet in these meetings. I give them first priority. And, uh, but we'll try to stay in contact and get all that worked out by at least Tuesday night or Wednesday. So thank you all for being part of this service, and God bless you. Okay.